Jayprakash Radhakishan Thani, also known as Prakash, age 73 years, of number 112 Bel Air Terrace, St. Philip, entered peacefully into rest at the Queen Elizabeth Hospital after a brief illness. Managing Director of Shoemasters Limited, Thani Shoe Shop, Brands and Indian Grill Restaurant. Loving husband of Nina, son of the late Radhakishan and Janki Radhakishan Thani, brother of Hiranand Durupadi and the late Dr. Suresh and Durga, brother in law of Nisha, Anita, Mohan, Vinod, Sushi, and Raju. Uncle of G2, Jarish, Neil, Sanjita, Lavina, and Reshu. Stepson of Seima, Radakashen Thani. Beloved friend of Aaron and Deidre Skeet, John and Calva Williams, Trevor and Pisame, I repeat, Trevor and Pisame Mall. Roger and Suzette Holford, Jennifer Lynch, Reggie Medford, present and former employees of Shoemasters Limited, and the brothers and sisters of the Christian Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. A memorial service for the late Jepakash Radakashen Thani leaves a Belmont funeral home on Wednesday, October 4th, 2023, for the Chapel of Coral Ridge Memorial Gardens, where relatives and friends are asked to meet at 3 p.m. for the service. Cremation will follow. The service may be viewed via live stream at www.belmontfuneralhome.live Lepakash Tani. This 
earthly paradise was just around the corner. There's a house down in the valley and a house high on the hill. There is singing by the river as the water flows and turns the mill. The golden fields are waiting, let the harvesting begin, once the world we're living in was just around the corner. It's great to share with friends who care the things that we looked forward to, now every tear has disappeared, the world is young. Life is new, there's the sound of happy voices And the scent of new mown hay Now you're calling to your loved ones As you start another perfect day Then we thank our God Jehovah For his tender loving care Yes, the blessings we all share were just around the corner and every day I smile and say how good to see your happy face as once it seemed I only dreamed that you'd be in my warm embrace waiting round the corner is a world I long to see it's a promise from it's a guarantee, reality And it's hard to get downhearted When I think of what's in store It's the day I'm waiting for And it's just around the corner
Once again, we want to extend a warm welcome and one thank you so much for supporting the family and friends of the late Prakash Thani. Just a little house cleaning before we get started. Um, we have seats reserved at the front for the family of the late Prakash Thani and those who are considered close family members. So feel free to come to join those who are already seated in those positions. The opportunity would have been given for persons to view the body um, early before the service because after the service, there will be a private ceremony for the family, um, for private arrangements that have been made for cremation for the body which will be done are reserved strictly for family members. To get our program after a start, for those of you who may have the hard copy, some of you may have the soft copy, and if you have the soft copy in your phones, just remember that there's an arrow on the right side of your screen that you can use to allow you to turn the pages. We want to start, first of all, with song number 18. It's a song that the, was appreciated very much by Prakash uh, as well, grateful for the ransom. If you can, would you please stand and join us in singing this song? And if you don't know the words, that's quite all right. You can hum along. You can just pay attention to the words because at the end of it, it is, these are words that are designed to give us encouragement at times like these. So if possible, stand and let us sing song number 18 together, after which we're going to ask Brother Downs to open with a word of prayer for us. Loving and kind Father in heavens, Jehovah, we are gathered to, here together to celebrate the life of our dear brother, Pikash. And as we meet at this sad occasion, we look to you for comfort. Because we know that you put eternity in our hearts and the death of a loved one continues to cause us pain. But he has given us a hope, a hope of the resurrection 
I hope that we will see our dead loved ones again. We know that Prakash would have cherished that hope. So we look forward to the time when he be resurrected. Look forward to the time when we can see our dead loved ones again. And the scourge of pain and death will be no more. In the meantime, Jehovah God, we look to you for comfort. And we pray that those who have received comfort from you will now give comfort to the family of our dear brother Prakash in this time of grief to help them to cope with this in a sad occasion. As we celebrate his funeral service, we want to reflect on our own lives, reflect on the fact that the hope of everlasting life is open to all of us. You've given us that opportunity because we know that you do not want anyone to be destroyed, but you or like all of us to attain to everlasting life. So help us to reflect on this and help us to align ourselves with you so that we too can have that hope. So we leave everything out to your loving care now. We ask forgiveness for our sins and we offer this prayer to you through the office of your son, Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you for those comforting words and thoughts, Brother Downs. This afternoon, the funeral discourse is going to be given by someone that we may all know, Brother Roger Holford. Not only is he a spiritual brother, but he's also someone who would work closely with Prakash and Nina when it comes to the business. So we encourage you please to listen. Of course, the scriptures are going to be used. Some of the things that may be said and you may not fully understand or appreciate, that's quite all right. But what we want you to take away this afternoon is that the words that are going to be presented are designed to give you comfort, something positive to think about. So let's invite Roger Holford now to the podium as he gives us our final discourse. Well, first of all, friends, um, on behalf of the family of our dearly departed, Jar Prakash, we often affectionately refer to as Prakash. On behalf of his loving wife, Nina, his brother, Hiranand, his sister, Duru, and all of the extended family, we want to certainly express our appreciation for the comfort that you have provided and your being here. It certainly is a display of affection that you would have had for our daily departed Prakash. Now, over the course of his 73 years, uh, Prakash would have attended many funerals. And one of the things that he would always reflect upon was that when he left the funeral, he would oftentimes feel comforted. And that might seem to be a bit surprising because when we come to a funeral, when we come to a house of mourning, it is a house of mourning. And it is a place that is associated with sadness, with grief. But Prakash really appreciated the comfort that he would receive from God's word, the Bible. And that is what we are going to be doing this afternoon, as, as Brother Moore alluded to in his opening comments. We're going to be using God's word, the Bible, something that Prakash himself was dearly and deeply devoted to because he saw it as the word of his God, our creator, Jehovah. And the guidance that we find therein actually provides us with comfort on this day of sadness. Using God's word, the Bible, I, I want to share with you a scripture here at um, Ecclesiastes chapter 7 and verse 1 that speaks to why it is we can view coming here to the house of mourning as something that is comforting. They were told at that scripture, Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 1, a good name is better than good oil, and the day of death is better than the day of birth. Now when you hear those words, you might be wondering, well, how is that possible? How can the day of death a day of mourning, a day of sadness, be better than the day of birth when we all know when a child is born, we are so happy, we are so re rejoiceful. Well, how is that possible? Well, what the Bible is telling us here, friends, is that when a person is born, that individual has no name. In other words, they have no reputation. They haven't lived a life and left behind a record that can be examined and appreciated. Whereas when a person passes away, when a person dies, after having lived a life, 
then that person had the opportunity to develop a name, to make a name, a good reputation. So that if a person dies after having lived a life where they made a good name, a good reputation, and according to what the scriptures are telling us, the day of that person's death would be better than the day of that individual's birth. So the question is, what about our dearly departed Prakash? What sort of name did Prakash make with his fellow men? Was it a good name? Well, to help us in that regard, we are going to pay attention to Prakash's relationships with two specific classes of individual. First of all, I want to invite um, Sister Mall to the, to, the, to the platform here. Sister Mall, along with her husband, Trevor, were very close friends of Prakash and Nina. And this was for over 30 plus years. And so, Pisamai, I wanted to ask you, in all your years of knowing Prakash, what qualities would you say that you would have come to appreciate and admire? Well, I have known Prakash for over 31 years. In the early days of coming to know Prakash, I have always known him to be very friendly, outgoing, easygoing, and very thoughtful person. So I was drawn to him because of his genuine love and thoughtfulness. And that had not changed over the years, except our friendship deepened and grew. Prakash has a very unique personality, which was not always easily understood. Beneath the surface, though, there were many hidden gems, which were not easily discernible either. Prakash became like a blood family to Trevor and I, especially to our son from the time he came to know his beloved uncle Prakash at the age of four. Left a very deep impression in his heart all through his life up to now, and he's very saddened for this loss. A few gems I would like to share with you about my beloved friend Prakash. Foremost was his outstanding love for his God and creator, Jehovah, which he always expressed by, look, by looking for an opportunity to talk to persons about Jehovah. Next gem, his extraordinary kindness to fellow men, including strangers, was evident, too numerous to mention, many times to the expense of his own um, finance and even the risk of his safety. Lastly, his love and fondness of children. I'll give you the example. Almost after, after almost every meeting, especially midweek meetings, Prakash would go to the shop next door to buy popcorns for the children. And he made sure that none of them is missed. When he recognized one or two children were not there, he knew it too, that he must send those popcorns to them with the families. Yes, and that is something that I can appreciate, friends, because I'm 58 years old now, but as a four-year-old, I remember going to the Kingdom Hall. And for, for a four-year-old, two hours is a long time, is an eternity. But there were brothers and sisters who would ensure that after the meetings, they give you some sweeties, they give you some candy, and they give you something to look forward to. So I can appreciate the, the love that Prakash demonstrated in that regard. But you can go on, Sister Long. Yes. Um, you had mentioned to me as well um, that, that um, you mentioned about your son who viewed Prakash as his uncle. Did he have any thoughts that he wanted to share with us as well? Actually, he wrote a very touching note to Antonina, which I'm going to extract some to share with everyone. Okay. In honor of Uncle Prakash, Uncle, you were kind, hardworking, traditional, free spirit, quirky, people person, God-fearing. My parents had a very small circle of friends in Barbados 
safe to say that Uncle Prakash and Auntie Nina were the closest. They were closer to us than actual blood family. This means I lost a father figure. Uncle Prakash always looking out for me as a child, sending me gifts, showing interest, giving me advice, treating me like an adult even before I became one. Uncle Prakash's loving presence and constant kindness will be a big loss to the community and all people he touched. Thank you very much for those words of kindness. I'm and certain does brother, appreciate it. I would like to say a little conclusion from Trevor and I. Okay. Trevor and I are very thoughtful, very thankful to Jehovah for providing friends like Prakash and Nina. It started in 1992. A loving, concerned sister suggested to me that I need to reach out to Nina. She felt that I would be able to help assist to help Nina to settle into a new country as I was li already living here for five years before Nina arrived. We immediately connected when we first met. As our friendship grew, our husbands also became closer to one another. We became family to one another. We have been there for each other over the years since our families are not in Barbados. So it goes without saying that I will always be here for Nina to support her through the time of grief and beyond. Thank you for those words. Now friends, those are the heartfelt words of an individual who was a close friend of Prakash. But when we look here in the audience and we see all the faces of such a diverse group of individuals, we, we are fairly concerned, we are fairly convinced, I should say, that this was an individual who made a good name with each and every one of you. But there's a saying that I came across um, a couple of weeks ago. It spoke about the measure of a man. And what it said in part was that the measure of a man is highlighted by the thoughts and feelings of those that, in the, that man leaves behind when he passes. And if you, take, if you think of that perspective, the person, the human, who was closest to Prakash, the person who knew Prakash the best, was his dearly devoted wife, Nina. And because she knew him the best, she would have seen his flaws, she would have seen his foibles, she would have seen his good points and his bad points. But I want to share something that Nina shared with everyone. If you take a look at your, um, your program, she made an interesting statement that really tells us a lot how she feels about Prakash. We all have our flaws and imperfections, but for me, Prakash was perfect for he had the purest heart and his love for me was gentle, protective, and kind. Those were the heartfelt words of Prakash's beloved wife, the person who knew him best. They were married for 32 years, correct? 32 years. She is expressing her feelings about her beloved Prakash. So when you take all of this into consideration, friends, you can be absolutely certain that this was an individual who made a good name. But having said that, we spoke about a good name with fellow men. But is that all? Is that all that is required? Well, Prakash knew of the words of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And on one occasion, Jesus was asked a question. Teacher, tell us, what is the greatest commandment? And what he said, is instructive because it helps us to appreciate who else Prakash needed to make a good name with. Because Jesus said, the first and greatest commandment is that you must love Jehovah your God with your whole heart, with your whole mind, with your whole strength. And the second is that you must love your neighbor as yourself. Prakash certainly loved his neighbor as himself. And the fact that all of us are here this afternoon is a testimony to that. But what about the name that Prakash made with his God, Jehovah? Well, Prakash was born into a family that was very religious um, in the, the, the religion of Hinduism. 
But he was an individual who seemed to be very curious. So he would oftentimes read literature from other religions. So he would have the, um, the plain truth um, brochure. He would read that regularly. And from time to time, he would come across the Watchtower magazine. He would read that as well. On one occasion, Prakash, one of his employees, invited pa Prakash to come to attend a memorial at the Congregation of Jehovah's Witnesses. And Prakash, unbeknownst to her, actually went. And he enjoyed what he learned. And what happened thereafter was that Prakash commenced a study of God's Word, the Bible. And what he learned convinced him that he wanted to serve and worship the one true God as one of Jehovah's Witnesses. And Prakash was baptized 35 years ago as a dedicated servant of the universal sovereign Jehovah God. Now, over the course of Prakash's life, Prakash's, Prakash demonstrated his commitment and his devotion to his God. Because Prakash understood, yes, we must love God with our whole heart and our whole mind. But what does it really mean to love God? Is it just a fuzzy feeling, a warm feeling in our heart when we think of God? The Bible tells us that what the love of God means is that we obey his commandments. And that is exactly what Prakash endeavored to do. And very, in, in a very, very special way, because Prakash was an individual, and I'm sure many of you would appreciate that oftentimes you're at home, you get a knock on your door in the morning, a Saturday morning or a Sunday evening, you think to yourself, Jehovah's Witnesses. And Jehovah's Witnesses are known for going and declaring, preaching the good news to, uh, to individuals at their homes. Prakash was a necessary strong in that particular area. He didn't feel comfortable as he would have liked to help. But what Prakash made his area was informal witnessing. Wherever Prakash went, he took with him tracts, he took with him publications, and whomever he met, whomever he met, Prakash would share a message of hope of God's kingdom. Um, Calva sent me a note and she told me that when they would go to trade shows, Prakash would accompany them, but then he would disappear. Because he would go to all the trade show booths and he would be preaching, he would be leaving literature. So much so that when they go to visit the same um, uh, vendors, they would say, oh yes, we already saw Prakash. He already shared with us the good news. That was the measure of the man. But what really was outstanding with Prakash in this regard is that when Jehovah's Witnesses initiated the Metropolitan Witnessing Program, where you would see us in, in, in Broad Street at the post office in various locations around Bridgetown with our literature cards, Prakash was one who thought that that was the absolute best way for him to assist Jehovah. And he wanted to make sure that he not only was a witness of Jehovah, as a Jehovah's Witness, but he was a witness for Jehovah. And he wanted anything that was associated with him to also witness for Jehovah. And that is why anytime you pass Danny Shusa on Swan Street or Bridge Street, you would see a Jehovah's Witness witness card there. Because Prakash wanted persons to know that he was a servant of Jehovah and he was proud to let everyone know that. So when you take all that into consideration, friends, we can say without doubt that this was an individual who lived up to his dedication, and therefore, he was an individual that we can say made a good name with his creator. And Nina, that is something that can give you comfort in the times going, uh, going forward. But having said that, while we can say that that is, 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 is good to hear that Prakash would have no doubt has a, a good name of Jehovah, it doesn't mean, friends, that we don't, we're not going to miss him. It doesn't mean that we are not grieving at this particular point in time. And we have to understand, friends, that grief is something that is a natural reaction to the loss of the loved one. And this is simply because we are not wired to get used to death, the death of a loved one. And that is why no matter how many times you come to a funeral, no matter how many times you come to say goodbye to somebody that you love, your reaction is always going to be the same. There's going to be sadness. And this is something that God's Word the Bible reveals. So for instance, when um, the patriarch Abraham lost his beloved wife, Sarah, she was 127 years old when she died. But when he lost her, the Bible tells us that Abraham grieved. He was inconsolable. When the patriarch Jacob was informed that his son, Joseph, was killed, the Bible tells us that Jacob was inconsolable. But it also tells us something that 
is really poignant for us today. I want to share with you what we're told at um, Genesis chapter 37, verses 34 and 35, in reference to this matter with Jacob losing his son, J um, Joseph. They were told with that, Jacob, Jacob ripped his garments apart and put sackcloth around his waist and mourned his son for many days. And all his sons and all his daughters kept trying to comfort him, but he kept refusing to take comfort, saying, I will go down into the grave mourning my son. And his father continued weeping for him. Now, what do you think about those words? I will go down into the grave mourning my son. This man, Jacob, never expected that he would ever get over the loss of his loved son. He would take that to the grave with him. And we have to understand that that is what grief can do. Some persons can, get over, can grieve for a couple of weeks and they get back to normal. But there are other persons, friends, who will never get over the loss of a loved one. They will take that grief to their grave. And that is because our losing a loved one in death is not natural. When we think of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when he was on this earth, he was a perfect man, sinless. But when he experienced the loss of his friend Lazarus, the Bible tells us something quite interesting. I want to share with you what we're told here. Um, John chapter 11, verses 20, 33 to 35. And what happens here is actually very instructive because I want to understand that when this occurred, Jesus had already apparently prayed to his heavenly father requesting permission to resurrect Lazarus from the dead, right? So he had already received a response from his father, yes, you go ahead and resurrect Lazarus. But nonetheless, notice what transpired. When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her weeping, he groaned within himself and became troubled. He said, where have you laid him? They said to him, Lord, come and see. Jesus gave way to tears. Understand, he knew he was going to resurrect Lazarus, but yet he still cried. Why? Because he saw the effect that the loss of their loved one had upon Lazarus's friends, his family. And Jesus empathized. He felt their pain. He felt their sadness. And friends, that is instructive for us today. Because our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is now alive. He's now a mighty um, spirit creature in heaven. But what this tells us is that as he sits next to his father in the heavenly realm, and they look down upon us here at this house of mourning, they empathize with Nina. They empathize with Hera. They empathize with Juru. They empathize with all of us because of the grief that we feel, and that is comforting. But the wonderful thing about our great God, Jehovah, is that he does more than simply empathize. Jehovah provides comfort. He provides us with a hope. What is that hope? You're going to talk about that now. You see, Jehovah, the universal sovereign, is a God of wisdom, justice, love, and power. And what he wants us to understand, friends, is that it was never his intention for us humans to have to deal with the loss of a loved one in death. That was never his original purpose. The reason why we die is as a result of the disobedience of one man, the first man, Adam. When God put Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, there in the midst of the garden, there was a tree that the Bible refers to as the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And what that tree really represents was the fact that God as the creator, as the universal sovereign, as the giver of life, the source of life, he determined that he reserved for himself and himself alone the right to set the standard by which intelligent creation would live the lives that he has given them. So in other words, he didn't give mankind the right to decide for themselves what was right and what was wrong. He would decide what was right and what was wrong. And humans would enjoy their lives for all eternity as long as they recognized and respected that that was his purview, that was his responsibility and his own alone. When Adam and Eve ate of the forbidden fruit, what they were basically saying was, we don't want you to tell us how to live our lives, we want to do as we please. And all they haven't, the universal sovereign simply did was remove his gift of life from them, and they passed away. But here's the thing, friends. Because Adam did that, 
before he had the opportunity to have any children. What he brought upon himself, he then passed on to his unborn children. What Adam brought upon himself was sin and imperfection. And he passed that on to each and every one of the humans that would be born from his loins. And that is why all of us today are sinners. But with sin comes an unfortunate side effect. Romans chapter 5 verse 12 tells us this. That is why just as through one man sin entered into the world and death through sin. And so death spread to all men because they had all sinned. This is the fundamental truth that Prakash understood. All of us friends, no matter who we are, we are sinners. In other words, we fall short of God's righteous standards. We cannot not sin. That is the unfortunate reality that we face. And the wage that sin pays, the wage that we are paid after living a life of sin, is that we die. That is the unfortunate reality. That is why Prakash is lying here before us in death, because of sin. But the Bible gives us hope, friends. Jehovah, our great creator, gives us hope. Because remember we said that he is the God of love, the God of wisdom, the God of justice, the God of power? Well, his love is manifested in that Jehovah understands that we are sinful. We are in this current state through no fault of our own. None of us here this afternoon were in the Garden of Eden. None of us here made any decision to eat the fruit that Jehovah God had forbid to be eaten. But yet, because of what Adam did, we are suffering the consequences. So Jehovah doesn't really blame us because he understands that we are in this situation through no fault of our own. And that is why, friends, Jehovah has made it possible for us to gain salvation. How did he do that? Matthew chapter 20, verses 28 tells us, this is something that Prakash knew only too well. Just as the Son of Man came, not to be ministered to, but to minister and to give his life as a ransom in exchange for many. The Son of Man is our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Our great God, Jehovah, through his love, through his compassion, through his mercy, allowed his only begotten Son to come to this earth, to be born of a woman, and to give his perfect life as a ransom in exchange for many. So that what Jesus did was he, or I should say, Adam sold us by his disobedience into slavery to sin and death. Christ, by his obedience and by giving up his life as a ransom, has bought us back. And that has given us the opportunity, friends, that if we exercise faith, in Jesus if we believe in him and manifest that belief through obedience to his commands then we can attain to salvation and that salvation can lead to everlasting life but Christ's ransom opens the door for something even more wonderful friends the Bible tells us that something here in John chapter 5 verses 28 and 29 that I want to share with you these are the words of Jesus himself do not be amazed at this, for the hour is coming in which all those in the memorial tomb will hear his voice and come out. This, friends, is the promise of the resurrection. In other words, those who are now asleep in death have the opportunity that if they are in the memory of our Creator when they die, they can be brought back to life. That is the promise that God has given. And as a matter of fact, this is something that Prakash really believed in. It was a pillar of his faith. And, and, and he, he personalized it in a very interesting way. Prakash had an older sister. Her name was Durga. She was born with Down syndrome, and she died um, at the age of 46 in the year 2000, I'm, I'm told. And one of the things that Prakash always told me was that he had this fervent desire. And he had this, he was utterly convinced 
that the time would come when his great God Jehovah would resurrect his beloved sister Durga and he himself would take on the responsibility of teaching her about the universal sovereign. That was something that Prakash looked forward to. He was thoroughly convinced in the hope of the resurrection and he personalized it such that he himself was looking forward to seeing his loved one, his loved Durga, again in the paradise to come. That was the hope of Prakash. It can be the hope of Nina. It can be the hope of all of us. Now we will have the opportunity to see quirky, loving, animated, as, as, um, as Hero tells me, um, he was hyperactive. We would see hyperactive Prakash again in the paradise to come. That now leads us into this final question that I want us to, to, to discuss. Because we are here at the House of Mourning. How can we benefit from being here? How do we benefit from being here? Well, there are three principal ways that I want to, to address. First of all, we benefit from being here because we are here to demonstrate to the loved ones of Prakash, his wife, his family, that they are not alone in their loss. Prakash touched all of our lives in one way or the other, and we will miss him as well. So when Nina looks around and sees a congregation filled with these faces, she knows that her dear Prakash was not only dear to her, but he was dear to many others, and it's the same for his family. So our being here is a way that we demonstrate our empathy. Nina, you lost your husband. There are many wives in here who love their husbands. And they can empathize how they would feel if they lose their husband. Hira and Duru, you, you lost your brother. There are many siblings in here who can empathize with that. When you see us here, it helps you to appreciate that you're not alone in your loss. That's one way. There's a second way. We have the opportunity here at the House of Mourning to join with Nina in giving thanks to our great God, Jehovah. Why do I say that? Why do we thank Jehovah? Prakash knew something that I'm going to share with you. He understood the words that Jesus uttered. Jesus on one occasion said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to my Father except through me. That's what he said on one occasion, right? But then on another occasion, he said something else that is also interesting. He said to his disciples, No one can come to me unless my Father, who loves me, draws them to me. And that is something that is poignant. That is something that is significant for us today. Nina, we join you in thanking our Heavenly Father for drawing Prakash to his son, Jesus Christ. Because that allowed Prakash to come into a close and personal relationship with Jehovah. And that is something that you will treasure. And we want you to remember that. And we treasure it as well. But interestingly enough, in drawing Prakash to his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, Jehovah drew Prakash to somebody else. Listen to the words of Nina. He was a loving and caring husband. And listen to this. He was Jehovah's perfect gift to me, as James put it. Every good gift and every perfect present is from above, coming down from the Father of celestial lights. Those are Nina's words, friends. She viewed Prakash as a gift from her heavenly Father. So, Nina, we thank Jehovah for the gift that he gave you. You enjoyed 32 wonderful years with that gift. And you now have the prospect of seeing that gift again in the future. We praise Jehovah and we thank him for that. But there is a, a more existential reason why we benefit from being here at Jehovah's house, at this house of mourning. I want to share this, these words from Ecclesiastes chapter. 
There the writer was inspired to write this. I have seen something further under the sun, that the swift do not always win the race, nor do the mighty win the battle, nor do the wise always have the food, nor do the intelligent always have the riches, nor do those with knowledge always have success. Why? Because time and unexpected events overtake them all. Here's the reality, friends. We are sitting here today in this house of mourning. Prakash is lying in death. But every one of us, living and breathing, we know that time and unforeseen, unforeseen occurrence can befall any one of us at any time. Just last week, an individual got up early in the morning, got a bath, had his breakfast, and went to work at the Bridgetown Port, right? Just last week. What happened to him? Sometimes during the course of the morning, an unforeseen occurrence befell him. And I understand that a crane fell on him. Oh, sorry, a, a container fell on him. That is what we face every single day. Either we die by unforeseen occurrence, or we die, as Prakash did at 73 years old, the process, the natural process of aging. And when we come to the house of mourning, it gives us the opportunity to reflect on something that is very important. Notice the what we are told here in Ecclesiastes chapter 7. We read, we read from it earlier, all right? We read verse 1 earlier, but I'm going to read the verse 1 and 2 now to get, give you the full context. A good name is better than good oil, and the day of death is better than the day of birth. Better to go to the house of mourning than to the house of feasting, for that is the end of every man. And the living, listen to this, the living should take it to heart. What this is telling us, friends, is that because we all appreciate that it could just as well as been any one of us lying in the, cas the casket here. Because we all appreciate that death can come to any one of us at any time. It could be in the next 20 minutes. It could be as we are driving home from this funeral. It could be as we are laying on our bed tonight. We do not know. Because we are aware that that can happen. And when we come here, we need to sit and we need to think and reflect contemplatively on how we are living our lives because it could just as well be us. This is something that the Bible writer of the, the book of Psalms in one of the, 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 the passages of the book of Psalms, Moses, came to realize the reality of death. It should help us to think about how we are living our lives. This is what um, Moses wrote. In Psalm 90, verse 12. And, and to give you the context, this is when he had mentioned that the days of our lives are so brief. They are 70, 3 score and 10, or 4 score 80, if by special mightiness. But nonetheless, they quickly pass by and away we fly. So he understood how quickly our lives pass by. And most of us here can appreciate that. I look in the audience and I see some young persons, right? Just yesterday at lunch, I was talking to, to, to the, an individual. And he was telling me, when he was 18 years old, his grandmother was 54 years old, right? And he used to look at her and say, my granny is so old. But now he is 54, right? He's 54. And he is thinking, but where has all the time gone? It didn't seem like that long a time. So the Bible's words are quite clear and they're true. We can appreciate that. The 18 year olds in the audience, the 20 years in the audience may not necessarily understand it right now. But trust me. I am 58 years old, and I went past 18 a long time ago, but it doesn't seem that long. Time flies. So as a consequence, the Bible writer there at Psalm 912 made a request to his creator. And listen to what he said in verse 12. Teach us how to count our days so that we may acquire a heart of wisdom. Why would he ask Jehovah to teach him how to count his days? Well, after what he said, he appreciated that the life that we live, the days that we have in our lives, are precious. They are a precious resource that we do not ever want to waste. The best way that we can use our lives, friends, is to bring that heart of wisdom in. Now, when the Bible mentions the heart of wisdom here, it is not talking about the wisdom that we get at the University of the West Indies, the, the wisdom that we got when we were at school studying the books of philosophy. That is not the wisdom that is referring to. The Bible tells us that wisdom has its genesis, has its start with a fear 
of Jehovah. In other words, what Moses was asking his creator to help him to do was to live his life in such a way that he treasured every day as a resource that he could use in making a good name with his God. And that is what Moses did. And that, friends, is what we need to be contemplating as we sit here in the house of mourning. How are we living our lives? Are we living our lives in such a way that we are actually making a good name with our creator? Are we engaging in holy acts of conduct, deeds of godly devotion? Are we individuals who are known in our communities as loving, caring citizens? Is that the way we are living our lives? Well, if we live our lives like that, then what we are doing, as Jesus encouraged us to do, is we are storing treasures up in heaven. We are making, my friends, a good name with our Creator. Prakash has now passed away. He made a good name with his Creator. He has finished his course. His future now depends on when his creator calls to resurrect him to life. What we need to be doing as we live the rest of our lives, as we live, live here, we need to be reflecting on what can we do to live a life, live our lives in such a way that we bring that heart of wisdom in, that we demonstrate by the choices that we make, by the decisions that we take, that we recognize and appreciate that we did not make ourselves. We owe our existence to our creator, Jehovah God. Nina, on behalf of myself, my family, we express to you our sincerest condolences. And we trust, friends, that over the coming days, the coming weeks, that we reach out to Nina, we reach out to Hero, the family, because they're going to need our comfort as they get through this difficult time. Thank you, Roger, for helping us to appreciate those thoughts. And as you rightfully said, all of us are in need of comfort, so we want to do all we can to reach out to all family members and friends um, of our dear brother, late brother Prakash Thani. Now there may be a number of things that were discussed this evening that you don't understand, you don't follow. Would you like some additional information? It's quite all right. You can feel free to ask any one of us as Jehovah's Witnesses, any of the attendants, or we can show you how to find that information in the privacy and comfort of your home by going on our website. Either one we can do for you. Now, many of you may not have had the opportunity to express your personal private thoughts to the family members, and that's quite all right. And you will always have the opportunity to do so afterwards. However, we are asking, please, on behalf of the family, that if you wish to do so, that you do so on another occasion after the service. The reason why we are asking that is that immediately after the service, the family would require us to give them the privacy that they would need to conduct the private cremation ceremony. So if possible, we want to honor that request. So if you have your comments that you wish to share with the family, we would appreciate it if you could do it at another time so that they can have that opportunity to do so. It is interesting in our program, if you look at your program, the center of it, there are a number of pictures with Prakash. All the pictures speak to the kind of person that he was, his personality. And we as human beings, we appreciate the importance of having pictures because pictures help us to remember individuals. But more so, pictures help us to appreciate those whom we want to remember. The question is, do you think that God the person that Prakash was so devout in worshiping, do you think he wants to remember Prakash? Well, that's the song that we're going to sing to help bring our service to an end. It's song number 151 in your program. 
And in those words, you will notice that it helps us to appreciate what God's view is. Does he want to remember Pocash? Does he remember such individuals? So if possible, please, would you like to stand and join me in singing song number 151, He Will Call, after which we will invite Brother Brathwaite to offer a closing prayer for us. Kind and loving God in the heavens above, we approach you at this time asking for your undeserved kindness and for your Holy Spirit. We are here at the funeral of our dear brother, Brother Prakash, and we know it's a sad occasion, especially for the family and also for the extended friend. So we ask that you continue to give them comfort by means of your spirit. We are grateful for your worthy Bible and because of the information that we heard here today, that will help to bring some comfort to the family as they continue to mourn the loss of their loved one. We also want to play a part. We want to also share some comforting words 
from time to time with them, and especially coming from your words, the Bible. We are grateful for the gift of your dear son, Christ Jesus, when he died on behalf of all of us. And because of his death, that gave us the hope, the hope that Prakash was so dear, the hope of a resurrection, where he was able to come to life, as I, and as I said in the Bible book of Job, you will call and he will answer. And he looked forward for that time. And we also look forward that we will be united once again with him. So Jehovah God, we are so grateful and thankful for such comforting words. And may we continue in the weeks and months to come to continue to bring some comfort to the family as they continue to mourn the loss of their loved one, Jehovah God. We know that you as you mentioned that you are the word, you God of all comfort. And by us being able to receive that comfort from you, then we in turn can comfort other person. So may you continue to bless us by means of your Holy Spirit, and as we continue for the rest of the evening, we want to do so in a loving and caring manner. This is the prayer that we offer to you at this time, Jehovah God, and we do so in the name and the office of your Son and King, Christ Jesus. Amen. Thank you. So, Nina... Hira and Dura and you family, we want to thank you for allowing us to have a share in this funeral service. And to those of us in the audience, on behalf of the family, we want to thank you for your expressions and your support. We do encourage you all to have a good evening. Thank you. Singing.